Hey, welcome to this week's episode. So this week's episode is with Mike Robertson. And you might know Mike from all over the place, from TV, was watering his chef, he's got his own pub, maybe he's eating his, in his pub, all sorts. But where I found him, where a lot of people who I know found him, is Farming the Wild on Instagram, YouTube, that sort of thing. And he's been doing some great stuff with all that and pushing the education that comes along with it. Now in this episode we talk about why deer numbers have risen through COVID, the problems we're having, um, not being able to sustain it and the knife edge that we're on and we're going to lose it. But before we, d we delve in, please, please, please hit the subscribe button for more content in every couple of weeks and your podcast goes out. Also check out Mike's website, all the links and the Instagram are below in the description. So, without further ado, let's crack on. The, the problem this year, which I'm continually, which is what I'm basically on a sort of mission to try and change, is obviously uh, environmentally I'm deeply concerned that there's going to be a, an eye-watering increase in numbers next year across the whole country. Um, and six months ago, people were going, nah, I'd be all right. And, and now it's like, yeah, there, there is. There's a big um, boom. It's been a big, big boom. Well, we won't really see it till next year. It's already been this year because last March, no one shot nothing. But, um, and the price of venison obviously went down to buttons yeah. uh, last November, a year ago in November. But this year, I mean, next year, we're going to see a biblical increase in fallow deer, particularly in all of them. Um, I mean, we've on, on Bathurst, on the main estate I manage here, it's nearly 16,000 acres. It's 5,000 acres of woodland. We've shot 550 deer since August. Um, yeah, you wouldn't know we shot one. Um, and uh, and uh, that's 350 fallow um, and munjak and roe. But, I mean, nobody around us has shot any. So really? the six biggest really? dates around us. It's it's funny because I think we're going to get a true picture of deer this year than we would have had in previous years because like we've not had the shooting stuff hasn't been pushed around like it normally is. So you've got a true. I think I think if it, each state was to sit back and look, you'd get a truer a truer you know grasp of. of well, a lot of them don't want to, a lot of them. I mean, the, the the simple, they don't want to admit what's going on, but the simple maths is un, inescapable that um, that none of the game dealers are accepting venison. And and uh, if that's the case in February and March, which are the culling months, yes. well, and Jan, well, this year, January, February and March, because there wasn't any pheasant shooting. But, you know, so you, you're going to see, I think you're going to see an increase across the country of 40% yeah. in one year. And that for the environment, for forestry, for regen, for biodiversity is, is really bad shit. Yeah, and, and it's gonna take it's gonna take years to pull that back because because we've also lost our prime market for exporting. We can't sell to Europe. Yeah. Um, even even though the 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 problems are going to be sorted out in Europe with export. The bottom line is they have the same issue. <laughs> yeah. They've got they've got a forty percent increase in wild boar, in deer, in everything else. So they don't need to buy our deer anymore. They've got meat, haven't they? So, so where's the my thing is where's the market? It's all about the market, and it drives me nuts when I see people on things like Deer Stalking UK banging on about how game dealers are you know uh, are, um, uh, ripping them off. The bottom line is a game dealer is a middleman. If he doesn't have a market to sell the product, he ain't buying the product. No. Or he's going to pay very little for it. Yeah, it's like pheasants. Nobody eats pheasants, so you get nothing for them. 100%. So, so next year, next four to five years, the only solution is to um, create a domestic market for venison. And that's my current major goal. Um, yeah, well, I was going to, oh, actually, that was, well, I was about to ask about that because you've <laughs> gone from being a award-winning chef you know, and um, restaurateur, as it were, to, to, and hunting to this this absolute niche you've made for yourself. Really, it's it's quite a, it's quite a concept. 
Mm. Um, and I and I, I applaud it because it's it's the same it's the same direction. Though you've gone it we've gone to, down with the venison side, I want to do it with the shooting and conservation side. It's the fact that we need to understand and what we can do with it to make it all happen. Because unfortunately, without without, without us intervening, it's not there's not going to be an end game anymore. The, the issue with the shooting, I hate the word industry, but the issue with the the shooting family in the UK is that. Um, we as a group of people, as a demographic in the country, are all always looking at, um, at our own industry. We're always looking at what we can do for shooting, how we can do this. How we do... We're all missing the point. The point is that we can't sell all this product to ourselves. It's got to be sold to the public who aren't in our community. And so we have to think, we have to think about market. The magic word is market. We can't shoot anything unless we eat it, and if we eat it, it has to have a market. So, so I and I, I've been I've, I've got a, ma- a fantastic follower of haters in the stalking world because I'm I'm very black and white about about um, well, it, it, they don't want to hear it. But the truth is, for it, here are some of the big issues involved in getting wild deer to market. One lead with venison. Very soon, you just market forces will say that you won't be able to shoot anything with a lead cord bullet. That's just the way it's going. I'm donating a lot of venison to charity at the moment to the Country Food Trust. Non lead and absolute. If 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 we were to slip a lead a lead shot carcass in there, they cut it off immediately. It's just whether people like it or not just doesn't matter. It's just the way it has to be, you know. And I'm just pragmatic. If that's the way it's got to be. Let's suck it up and go that way and be good. Yeah, we've got you to know? look at the bigger picture. What's going to work? Right, and let's make it work. I said, and I had this conversation was- with someone this morning about um, uh, it, was, it was shooting and hunting in, in, in general, so about the hunting ban and everything mm-hmm. else. And, and, and now we've got such a problem because, like you said, everybody's worried about their industry. So whether it be shooting, mm-hmm. fishing, hunting, as soon as the band came in, they went, what are we going to get from it? And not how are we going to work together to make the best best from this? And now all of a sudden, we are now backpedalling in the water for the, exa- for the exact same reasons. Exact same reasons. And now people don't understand. I mean, I, I, I exp- like tell a lot of my friends who are big gym junkies, you know, they want to eat more game because it's higher in protein. Hmm. And... And I've, and I've done my bit, but we need to, it needs to be pushed more. It just does, it just needs to be pushed more because otherwise we're going to it's dire straits. Well, it is. I mean, I'm I'm working with venison because that's my business and that's what my passion. I'm not so much of a shooting man, although obviously cooking a great deal of wild game in all my restaurants, um, and I wholeheartedly support it. Um, you know, I don't think a lot of people don't realise that without with the whole British countryside was shaped by shooting. I mean, that's why it is as it is. So it, it, just stopping it isn't an option, but we have to, we have to adapt to, to, at the end of the day, we have to get on with the public who don't shoot. And you can't fight, you just can't fight all the time. No. Um, so you have to find a way of, 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 we have to find a way of doing it acceptably and correctly and, um, and making sure particularly that everything is safe and edible and, and utilized. Now, um, you know, the deer, going back to the deer, which is my thing, you know, we, we, I, I was selling all the deer on the land I managed to my restaurants in March 2020, and then my restaurants and other restaurants. And then COVID hit overnight, and game dealers went, stop. And I then went, okay, uh, I've got 30 carcasses hung up, <laughs> fallow deer, what do I do? So... I got a head chef from my restaurant down and uh, and he and I butchered all 30, broke them up, we, we vacuum packed them, we bought a, a posh labeling machine. We are of course an FSA registered deer larder, which is a tough qualification to get. Very few people are, but it does mean that I can export, I can do anything, I'm on the hot top of the heap for, quali- for that. And more people watching this should, if they've got, should get together with what you should do is you get three or four estates, should get together or keepers or whatever, create a central larder, 
get it FSA registered, get get it so that your deer are vet inspected. And that means that you are then able to command a higher price and your deer and create a brand around your deer. That's all I've done. But it requires more people to go, if I want to keep shooting lots of deer and I need to, this is what we have to do. And and that is because the, who knows how long the exemption for small quantities will last. You know, now we're out the EU. Yeah. Also, there's a lot of arguments right now. The Food Standards Agency don't like that very much because they can't. And also, for you know, at the end of the day, we should have one regulation for selling venison for hygiene standards, not three. You know, we should, at the moment, we've got me, FSA, I pay for a government vet to inspect me every week. Every carcass is stamped. We have huge HACCP boulders, temperature regulation, times from deer, from woods to larder, all this stuff. And then the other heat, you can just get, you can put a piece of plastic on, on your kitchen table and get a nice fridge and get yourself inspected by the local council and you're allowed to sell deer. Now, the problem with that is, it's perfectly legal. I have no issue with it. But I know that government are looking at it. And if government turn around and go, hang on, why have we got multiple layers? It, well, it's, you know, triple standard, be, it, it's triple standards at the moment. And and I get why they did it. It was an EU thing and to help people, small small, small producers do it. That's great. The problem La Hat is until somebody cuts a corner, they haven't been checked, someone gets ill, and the whole industry gets knackered. Yeah, because we're always, it doesn't matter what we do, when it's when it's involved with, with what we're doing, we're all tied with the same brush. Yeah. I, so, um, I said this originally, I said, you know, it's it's a case of, you know, one man shoots something and it's illegal, we're all, we're all murderers. But yet, Dr. Shipman killed loads of people, but you don't worry about the doctor killing you, do you? You go and see him when you're ill. And, well, that's the press, and that's that's yeah. the way it goes. It's, it's so, so we try to be whiter and white, and I... I um, And the other thing, I mean, the other thing I did, which is why we've had so much in the news recently about deer box, is uh, I engaged my restaurant PR agency, and I paid them to help me get the word out. And I know it's basic, but it really works. Because they don't, they're, they're not interested. They're not interested in um, getting to the sporting community. They're trying to get to the general eating public. Yes. So we leverage the restaurants. We use the restaurants because the restaurants give us great credibility for what we do. We then uh, push like crazy, and it's you know I, I've been doing the venison business for four years now. It's, it's still losing money. It doesn't make any money, but it will. But it has to get to a level of scale. So we are trying very hard to, to get, I mean, if you will look at the Times this Saturday, there's a quite a big article coming out in the Times this Saturday about wild venison um, and about us and people like us. I mean, you've got some really good people doing this in this country. There's people in your neck of the woods. There's, there's, there's um, Grow Game Larder. There's Curtis Pitts down in Devon. There's us at Deerbox. You know, there are people, but you've got to be entrepreneurial and you've got to grab it with both hands and go, we're going to be the best and we're going to do it really, really, really well. And, and that means, you know, that means you've got to be white and white about how you process and cull deer. People have got to, have got to start talking more about the whole where we shoot deer. This is another thing. If you, if you came into a deer larder and game dealers will tell you this, when an FSA vet is inspecting and an FSA vet sees a deer with a big hole through both shoulders, they'll just say, cut it off and get rid of it. And and so we've got this whole, is it ethical, isn't it? I mean, from my point of view, we shoot most of our deer in the neck. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to be a good compromise. It's very, very humane and ethical. Um, and uh, further away deer we shoot in the body, we use no lead ammunition. We, we make a great deal of effort. We never take a shot at a deer unless it's, totally side on and square if we're body shooting so we don't get shoulders um we always try and go two or three inches behind the shoulders so lungs and and we find that way we get very clean carcasses it's very humane um you know we haven't lost a deer in three years um we have dogs available to follow up if we need it so i think that uh, the way that deer management is going by and this is not my wishes this is market forces is going to happen is I think that uh, 
the the sort of era of no, of recreational stalking where a landowner will have a friend who'll go a weekend and shoot the odd deer. Well, I think the deer numbers are going to get to a point where there will have to be organised on a larger scale management. There have to be cooperative groups. Targets will have to be hit. Larders will have to be inspected. We're all going to have to up our game. Yeah, we should be doing already. It should be, it should be management. It should be management plans in already doing all that. Really, if you if you're a respectable, if you especially like where I come from, you know that that that's already happening. Like we need to do this because of this, and people need to look at it in in like you said, it needs to be done now. So we need to be white than white and crack on. So when the, when the government comes in and says, right, well, you do this, you go, no, actually, we're doing that already. Rather than these massive changes all of a sudden and everyone bumping the gums about it. And I think that I think that um, I think that it will move from um, from people <laughs> paying for stalking leases per se um, to more to who can do the best job of managing our deer, because there will always be the sporting element of it, but that doesn't interest me. I don't have anything to do with sporting deer stalking. Um, you know, we we are just just doesn't interest me. I have nothing against it. Um, Big revenue, but. but <laughs> it's not yes, it, it can be, but and and I think it's very sensible when you have to defray the costs, for example, of fallow deer management. If you can defray that against charging for robux, that's very sensible. <laughs> you know, as an estate, that makes great sense. Um, just personally, I don't. I, mean, I just. I, I, I don't really want. I don't really have any interest in it. But but the 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 management of deer on a on a on a British scale, on a larger scale, after COVID, is going to be interesting. I don't have all the answers. Um, I know how we do it and how we're planning on doing it, but it, it definitely needs to get more organised. We need to have more self-awareness. We need to be more self-regulatory, making sure that standards are really high. Um, you know, I don't think old Coke fridges are going to work much longer for people and things like that. I think if someone manages a respectable area of ground, I think they're just going to have to put in a real little larder, you know. They're not expensive to put in, really. No. I just think that's what, again, I think that the way it's going, market forces are going to determine that that's what's going to have to happen. Period. Yeah. So what's next for you guys? You Obviously, you're pushing hard with the meat. So what's the next step? Because you're doing, obviously, you've got your, your film, your, 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 TV, your, your filmy TV side of it as well, haven't you, with your, with your cooking and everything else. So so yeah. what's, what's next? So we're doing... Um, Farming the Wild, the show, uh, has done really well in the States. And I think people in the States are fascinated by what how we do things because it's just so un- incredibly different to what we do, what they do. Um, and it's much more matter of fact over here. And it's much more, as we've just talked about, management and meat production. Um, and we try to show, you know, honestly the way we do it and how we can get the best out of it with the food. And we always refer everything back to food and cooking. So... We're now making a, another series for Outdoor Channel, which I wouldn't be surprised if got shown over here too, um, <clears throat> which is called Wild Game Masterclasses. So that's all filmed in The Woodsman in Stratford. And that's cooking. Each episode is a dish start to finish with all the butchery involved and everything, be it an osso buco, a venison, a pheasant, spatchcock marinated and slow cooked, turkey, whatever. Um, really fun series. I've been... Uh, I'm also about to start now, just finished season three of Farming Wild and season one of Masterclasses. And I'm just starting to film the first episode of Fishing the Wild, which is our fishing equivalent. Yeah, I I, I, I had a poke round earlier on and saw that. I thought that's going to be something different. It's going to be great. And we're going to do, and that's going to involve like a tour of Britain, really. And it's going to be about feeding yourself from the water sustainably. So it's about it's not just fly fishing it's not it's not just rod fishing it's spear fishing it's foraging on the seashore it's 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 how to find the best marine and aquatic edibles and make full use of them so we're filming that over this summer and then we're going to do a wild fish masterclasses show as well busy man and there's possibly another show about um uh, in the pipeline which i can't talk about um but uh, that would be really fun, all about deer management in the UK and abroad. So 
Yeah, and another restaurant opening in May. Um, so I'm opening a new restaurant called The Forge in Chester on the 19th of May. So we're going up north. How, and how have your restaurants cut, um, been with the whole COVID? Well, it's, it's horrible, but, you know, we've made it through and we're very excited about the 17th of May. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's going to be a busy week. Um, so we're currently, we're currently stockpiling fallow and muntjac in our freezers, haunches, saddles and shoulders um, for each of the restaurants so that when we reopen, each restaurant's got 30 or so whole deer frozen down um, to see them through the first couple of months. Because yeah. that's another thing. Yeah. I'm not someone who thinks you should only eat game in season. I think oh, even in restaurants, I am very open about preserving our, our... So at Stratford right now at the Woodsman, there are six fallow deer hung up, all stamped, wrapped in muslin. We'll hang them for 10 days in, in, the, in the beautiful dry aging fridge. John, the chef, will break them all down, backpack the individual components. We'll have freezers full of beautiful fallow deer and muntjac and those will go on the menu from the 19th of, of May. Oh, that um, sounds fantastic. So, just as you say, just busy, busy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, and, and, it, and it's the way it's been. I mean, I, I love the fact that it's so, low it, though it's conservation and doing mm. what's right for the, for the countryside, but it's, it's all ethical and it's all going back in the food chain. And this is the bit that I've been trying to push more than anything else. I mean, I've... I haven't this year. I've eaten more pheasant than I probably have in the last fifteen um, because my views have changed a little. My views have changed a little bit, and I've, I'm, try, I'm now trying to push the side that you know the ethical side. And I've, I'm going to order another freezer downstairs, and everything I shoot and put in the you know in the freezer, and that's the way it's going to be because it's the way it should be. And I think once if the British public get, you know can see that and get behind it, that will do the industry. Yeah, the industry a lot of good. Well, well, it's interesting. We are we as a family are uh, basically live on venison. I mean, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, the odd bit of chicken, but venison. We have our own honey from our own bees. We have our own chickens. As of this summer, my plan is to never buy fish again. Yeah. Uh, I intend to fill my freezers with fish so that I, I catch, so that uh, so that literally our whole life is wild food. You know. And, and I think that that's, it's an interesting idea to do it. And uh, it's very doable in this country. We're yeah. so lucky. I mean, we're very rich with, with the game. Fish coming out of our ears. We've got crayfish in the rivers, fields of wild garlic, um, wild mushrooms, wild boar in the forest, Dean. You know, there's, there's everything in this country and it's all available and accessible. So we should be the biggest nation in the world of wild game munchers, you know, no question about it. Yeah. And it's just educating the public. So <clears throat> everyone like you and me, who has a voice, needs to shout as loud as we can and get it out. I mean, I, as I say, I've got, I'm slightly nervous about Saturday because there's a very big article in the Times coming out about it all, mm. about wild venison, wow. and how, we, how we cull them, what we do with it. And, I hope that things like that will really start people going, you know? Yeah. No, all, um, all, all publicity is good publicity, isn't it, so I'm told? It's really important. Um, and I think it's it's a story that needs to be told and talked about. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Um, and, and, it's got to be, and it's got to be made bigger. People have got yeah. to start, start, you know, thinking about what we're doing. It's because it's, otherwise it's all... It's all yeah, I fully agree with you. Um, <clears throat> Brilliant. That is, uh, it's, uh, it's been fantastic to talk to you. Let me just I want to say thank you very much. Thank you.